All right. So anything that you want to add to that before we get to the beginning of the cultural revolution? So there is one thing that happens that I think it's important to understand. We talked about this report that told about the problem with the Great Leap Forward causing famine Mm -hmm. and that it was suppressed. Well, one of the leaders actually started to talk about it and started to give this information to Mao and the party. I believe he was the head of the military at the time. When he came out Uh, with this, saying that this stuff was a problem, he was relieved of duty. Right. And he was punished for it. Pen, Pen De Huai. Yes, that's exactly who it was. What do you what do you recall of that instance? Because it it later showed up as a metaphor in a Peking opera. Oh uh, yeah, they had a high level retreat in famous mountain. It's called the Lushan, and and the original intent to have the meeting is basically for Mao to in a way to kind of self criticize and say, okay, he was kind of too aggressive, yeah. mm-hmm. trying. Uh, trying to push uh, the whole commune system. And so Panda Huai was circulating a report that he wrote. And that, in a way, at least Mao took it as a personal uh, attack on him. Mm. So so he actually, he did some maneuvering and some political politics. And so basically fired Pen mm-hmm. kind of, yeah. Yeah, and if I recall... He may have found his way into a prison at one point as a result of all of that, but he, he was probably removed from his position. Yeah, he was put in prison and died in a prison. Yeah. In 1958, Mao Zedong had launched China on its great leap forward to the modern age. Mao was the director on a huge stage set for communist achievement. In the countryside, peasant plots were seized and collectivized into big communes. In the euphoria of bigger, faster, better, harvest production targets were raised to ridiculous levels. When local officials were unable to meet those targets, they falsified figures rather than reveal the shortfall. The party chose to believe them. They exported free food to demonstrate their success. They encouraged the people to eat, even though the grain stores were empty. The result was famine on a massive scale. 30 million people died. Half of them were children. But the stark truth about the famine was covered up. The Communist Party was united in a conspiracy of silence. Its public image choreographed to acclaim the leader's policies. Mao would not tolerate public criticism. In the highest ranks of the party, there were mutterings of dissent, but only one man dared to voice his concerns. In July 1959, Defense Minister Peng De Huai wrote a letter to Mao directly criticizing the Great Leap Forward. He was immediately dismissed. And then a few years later, there is an opera called The Dismissal of Hai Ri from Office, I believe, or I I may have that pronunciation wrong, that told the story of, as the the traditional opera does, where they have ancient emperors and figures that they tell as parables for what's going on in the culture at the time. There is a lower level official that sees corruption and tries to sort it out and dismisses the corrupt people. And then the emperor himself comes and dismisses that middle level political official who was trying to fix things for, you know, pointing out the yeah. corruption in the empire. Mm. And Mao saw this and his wife saw this mm-hmm. and people started to write about it and say, this is actually something that's going on. China has an ancient theatrical tradition. Its oldest form is the allegory. Characters long dead are disguised to draw parallels with contemporary events. Politics are dressed up as theater. One such play was the dismissal of Hai Rue, performed in Beijing in 1961. Set in the declining years of the Ming dynasty, Hai Rue is the agent of the emperor 
sent to investigate corruption amongst local officials. He finds they have been seizing the peasants' land and leaving them hungry. He orders the guilty to be executed. But in doing so, Hai Ruei threatens the status quo. The emperor reacts. No one in the audience failed to see the political message. Here was a righteous hero punished by the boss for speaking out against a harsh regime. Now you see this play and the injustice done to the right. official. Well, that's exactly what happened with Mao dismissing right. because uh, of the honest truth of what right. happened in this famine. Right. And that type of dissent, you know, can start to build momentum and it can start to turn a populace against the people in power. Right. And as you know, Marxists do. They understand the power of literature and culture to shape people's minds. Right. They want to control that power, but they're also aware of how dangerous oh, it yeah. is for yeah. threatening their own power. Right. right. And so they saw this. On November the 10th, 1965, an article appeared in the Shanghai newspaper condemning Wuhan's play as a bourgeois attack on the communist system. Ostensibly written by his wife's radical colleague, Mao is said to have edited it himself. Published in a seemingly harmless theatre column, no one in the government would have missed its political message. It was a direct attack on the Beijing opposition, a signal to the people that Mao was making a comeback. A lot of the times when we think about revolutions, it's the name that historians give to a conflict mm -hmm. after the fact. In this case, Cultural Revolution was another propaganda campaign. It was another political campaign that the name was given by the people in charge of it. Mao set up, because he still had control of the party apparatus, he set up a cultural uh, revolution committee and they issued their own criticism of that play and then gave vague accusations of people infiltrating the party itself who were trying to follow these capitalist roads rather than the Mao Zedong thought, who right. were more in alignment with uh, the bourgeoisie reactionary line right, right, rather right. than socialist ideals. And because he didn't give a name to that, it just left this sense that there's we're being infiltrated by people who are not ideologically pure. Right. And that that letter that was initially published, I think it's May 16th letter, you can see it, there's a few translations. Oddly enough, the only translation I could find of it was on the Marxist website. But it's a really fascinating read and it talks about that play, that opera, and it talks about how we need to perceive moving forward. And it really sets the tone for, we need to have a cultural revolution where we purge our party, we purge our institutions of people who aren't following the true, pure principles of Mao Zedong thought. And so that, Many people point to that May 16, 1966 letter as the thing that starts the Cultural Revolution. It sets the stage for people who are not party actors to start to look for and make accusations of people who are working against Mao Zedong, against their communist ideals, against the thing that everybody's enthralled by politically. Mm -hmm. And so then we start to see some of the stuff that you described at the beginning of our discussion. We start to see college students who themselves were raised honoring Mao Zedong as this godlike figure. At that time, Mao does not have that. That was kind of the, during the cultural revolution, he became like God. But before the Cultural Revolution, he was the first among equals. So at that time, if you look at the, the official newspaper, the, the People's Daily, they actually have not just his own portrait on that. They also have Liu Shaoqi, they all have uh, Zhu De and the Fu mm -hmm. portraits on the front. So he was the first of the equal. But during the Cultural Revolution, he became the only one. There is nobody equal to him. Yeah. Okay. So there was, uh, did it kind of like ramp up how highly they revered him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He now, became a god during the Cultural Revolution. Now, I know a lot of people that talk about schooling in the midst of the Cultural Revolution talk about how when they were first learning language, some of the first words or sentences or phrases that they would learn would be 
in reference to Mao Zedong? First thing you learn is long live Chairman Mao. Yes. <laughs> the right. second thing is long live <laughs> the Chinese Communist Party. Right. And did, did that, that thing where the pointing to him and pointing to communism in the midst of education, infusing it into all of your lessons, whether it's mathematics or language or writing or anything, did that precede the Cultural Revolution? Because I know oh, no. before the Cultural Revolution, there was the socialist education projects where they educated the teachers and made sure that they were teaching principles of communism and the the correct political ideology. Did that pre-exist the Cultural Revolution, I guess, is my question. Definitely, uh, there is kind of ideology, kind of uh, brainwashing, but it's not, uh, in a way, it's kind of, how to say, it's not drastic. And uh, okay. it's, it's still, you're still uh, going to learn the Chinese classics. You're still going to learn, you know, about like mass and like physics, which talks about like Newton, talks about, you know, the, those famous scientists. Okay. So, so it's like the way actually I, I got into the literature before, before the cultural revolution is, of course, is much later. It was like after Mao died. So I, I remember the first time I actually read those kind of things that was just like, wow, it's totally different. I mean, the whole vocabulary and all that is totally different. Just as like then. They are night difference. The textbooks before the Cultural Revolution mm. and the textbooks okay. I had during the Cultural Revolution, they are just totally kind of light and day difference. Okay. All right. So I think we've got a couple of things to to cover here. So there was there was there were people in China who believed so much in the vision of Mao that came from outside of China. One of them is a gentleman by the name of Sidney Rittenberg. He was very much in alignment of, with socialist communism at the time and believed that Mao was on the right path. He came and joined him and was actually part of his inner circle. And he spent a lot of time in prison because he was eventually accused of being a Western spy. Right. Of course, as an outsider, there was a great deal of suspicion of outsiders. But right. he talks a little bit about, because he was in Mao's inner circle, about how Mao contextualized why he would have allowed the, the things that went on to happen, happen. And he's got a great quote that I want to cover now. In 1965, Mao returns for the first time to Jingyang Shan, where he fought in the 1920s. To those around him, the chairman seems nostalgic. They could hardly be more wrong. As Mao gazes out at the mountain fastness where he served his revolutionary apprenticeship, he's contemplating what lies ahead. We didn't understand it at the time, but in retrospect, he said we have to train a new, re a new generation of revolutionaries to take over from us. And the only way they can learn to be revolutionary leaders is to make revolution. Well, he didn't spell it out, but if you think about it, who were they to revolt against? His own government and party. They were, they were the only candidates. And that's what he had them do. It begins as a protest movement by middle school students who denounce the academic establishment and, above all, the party bureaucracy. In May, a young philosophy lecturer puts up a wall poster attacking the university authorities as reactionary. Mao takes up the cudgels on her behalf, and the woman, Nye Yanzhe, is catapulted to national prominence. Nye Yanzhe put up her poster here on a wall at the university that's been set aside ever since the 1950s for student debates. It marked the opening salvo of what would become known as the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, Mao's last doomed attempt to ensure that his ideas of revolution continued in China after his death. Within days, the movement caught fire like a trail of gunpowder. So we were introduced to a couple of things that uh, we're going to see more of. One of those is that these things are originating from students in schools. And we have examples both of middle school as well as at the university level. 
We've got these big character posters. Now, I've done a review of a lot of cinematic reproductions where people are making movies set in the 1960s in China. And in every one of those movies, you see that the walls of like these buildings are all plastered with these huge big character posters. What is what is going on with that? So basically, the, the woman you saw there, uh, she actually was a, a faculty member. She was a lecturer. And she was a longtime communist. So she actually write the big character poster to attack the leadership of that university. I think it's the Beijing University. Hmm. And that, in a way, started the whole thing. And now, it strikes me that these big character posters are placed up in public areas where everyone can see. They are naming and denouncing people in the community naming their sins and denouncing them in a way that's very public that immediately puts these people on notice that they are not pure, that they are targeted because they're not in alignment with the ideology of the day. Right. And, and, yeah. Those people had actually been attacked. Those were the, the leaderships of the, the school. It's not like just like some kind of, you know, middle level manager or something. They are the top people who are running the school. And uh, so they are attacking them because, hmm. well, because even because the the mouse goal is to is to attack Liu and uh, then who are at hmm. that time running the the country and running the party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all the different party apparatus under Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping are are devoted to them, not to Mao. And right. so if, if these people denounce that leadership, then they can be put out and then people who will be true to Mao's perspective will be put in their place. Those are the only ones that could survive the denunciation. Right. Um, in the various stories that I've read, I would clarify that early on it started like that. But as this performance of denouncing people in power who then lose their position starts to make its way through the culture over the ensuing couple of years, you start to see this happen on a much smaller petty scale where even people who have grudges personally against other people learn that by simply making an accusation that right. doesn't have to be backed up by any evidence, no. people that they may see as rivals or who have slighted them in the past can lose their position and standing. And that starts to become a widespread phenomenon. Right. And that's yeah. part of how this whole thing destroys the cohesion of the culture and society and makes everybody suspicious and resentful of everybody else because everyone may be subject to that type of persecution right. and struggle. And in a way, it's kind of like the French Revolution, but it's in a much, much bigger scale and more bloody because once the, the government and party hierarchy was uh, turned upside down and uh, there is no law and order, right? And uh, so it's become, in a way, it's become a pure democracy. I mean, the people who just gang up and whoever, you got more people, then you got, you got more power. There is about two years time. There is just a chaos mm. because the party and the government hierarchy are all dysfunctional. So there is no one there to in charge. And so the whole country became, it's basically anarchy. Yes. And, and mm. when you say that's dysfunctional, it's dysfunctional by design because we have accounts of Mao instructing local law enforcement to not interfere with the students. Right. And we haven't yet gotten to what the students are, are actually doing. It's actually in the early days of cultural revolution when there is still a government and the mm -hmm. law enforcement was told to don't get interfered, don't do anything. But eventually all of those got being kind of overthrown, ups, I mean, turned upside down, then there's no one there. So that's why you have, there is a, a period of time, like uh, there were just like people killing each other. Mm. They the, basically the rat guards, the rat guards split mm. into different factions and they got guns and all kinds of weapons. Then they just, you know, kill each other in the name of defending Mao. Yes. Well, I want to get to that when we get to kind of the midsection of this revolution. Now, something that Mao does brilliantly early on is he allows students to travel through the train system to be able to go anywhere. So you have right. students who want to see the world. They're young, they're college, middle school age. Suddenly they can go on any train system. They can go anywhere. And of right. course, they want to go and see Mao who's the person that is the embodiment of this new sense of freedom, this new liberation where they're able kind of to stand up to the older people
people and feel like they're good and justified in doing so. And so there's a series of weeks where millions upon millions of young people are going to Beijing. They're filling Tiananmen Square and they want to see Mao. And the energy of that moment it was captured on film. And, and right. that's where a couple of speeches are given that set the tone for the violence that follows. And I want to make sure that we include some of that. To Mao's delight, the political center of gravity in China is shifting. It no longer resides in the Central Committee. It's moved out onto the streets, onto the great square that lies before the Forbidden City. Dawn, August the 18th, 1966. Mao emerges in person to review his young supporters, a million or more shock troops who've responded to his call to uphold the purity of the Chinese Revolution. The Red Guards, who will soon separate into violent factions, all pledge to give their lives to defend the chairman's cause. So I want to pause really quickly. So we're listening now to the voice of Lin Biao, right. who was somebody that was very close to Mao. And when the other leaders started to kind of undermine Mao, uh, Mao brought Lin Biao in to be his secondhand guy. He was going to be his successor for a while mm -hmm. and, and right. had a prominent position over the military. What he's doing now is he's giving a speech out to these throngs of millions of young people that have taken up the, the armband of the Red Guard and have come to, to see their leader. And he kind of invokes something that will become very much associated with the Cultural Revolution, which is the concept of destroying the four olds. Right. And that's what we're about to see here. Right. Lin Biao's instruction to smash all old things is relayed at Red Guard meetings throughout China. Shop signs, which the Red Guards consider bourgeois, like that of this Peking duck restaurant, are pulled down and destroyed. Street names are changed, the old ones hammered flat as though the decadence could be beaten out of them. The road running past the Russian embassy is renamed Anti-Revisionist Street. And what is done to things is also done to people. When This unique black and white footage has lain hidden for almost 40 years. Most of it never seen before except by the Chinese police and a handful of top leaders. It provides an authentic picture of the ideological witch hunt that the Cultural Revolution was becoming, directed against former landlords, capitalists and anyone else with the wrong class background. 
。这个当时那个 police 啊，就是告诉我们地址，各当时那个派出所的片警，他都给我们提供这个名单，哪是斯蒂芬多的家的地址，完了让我们去抄去。因为当时，当时这个这个这个这种抄家的行为啊，不是特有特有严密组织的，啊，都是呃那个脑子一热就去抄去。呃，当时我们学校，因为我们学校在郊区，离的城里很远，我们主要是抄附近的那个农农农村的地主家，还有打死亡，好也也不少，啊，都是初中小孩干的。我们高中小高高中的干干的少，初中小孩干的。把我们学校附近的农村的地主，呃，基本上都打光、打、打死、打光了，消灭光了。毛主席教导我们，革命要靠自己，我们要自己教育自己，自己解放自己，自己起来老革命。无论是北京市的革命师生，还是各地的革命师生，在无产阶级文化大革命中。我们要打破资产阶级的思想，大力无产阶级思想，也就是大力毛泽东思想。中国共产党万岁！战无不胜的毛泽东思想万岁！我们伟大的领袖。So I wanted to make sure that I included all of that imagery, all of that, you know, the, the, the pomp, because it really, it's something that is almost spiritual. You can see it in the faces of the people who are there, you know, the object of their adulation, the, the shaper of their ideology is calling upon them to purge anything that is unclean. It, it's almost like a moral righteous indignation that they right. are able to feel justifies any of the invasions and, and attacks that they uh, then undergo. And it's so right. powerful. So, so Mao used those, those kids those yeah use their energy to overturn uh the government so that he got rid of his political enemies or rivals or whatever mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. he thought was kind of his threat and now he is the government right mm -hmm. now now when you are the government you have to maintain some orders yes so how do you maintain that order? and also during those two years there's no production going on I mean, people yeah. has to eat, right? You yeah. have to uh, revive the the economy. So what he did is he actually told the the red guards and said, oh, "Okay, now you have, you know, we have such a great victory, and uh, yes, now it's time for you actually go to the countryside and to, you know, to learn from the people, learn from the peasants, learn yeah. from the workers that right. represent who right. we stand for, right? Because you want to go pure, right?" I mean, yes. you have to go to learn from the farmers and the, the workers and especially the farmers because he, he doesn't want the red car to stay in, in the city. So he said, okay, you just go as far as you can go, go to the countryside. So there's a huge, I mean. That, yeah, that, that's a whole other chapter, and and the people who survived that, that then came on and told what that experience was like, are you know some of the most powerful voices today, talking about how they they realize what it meant to be used politically and then discarded as though their lives meant nothing, and they became very disillusioned right. with, right. you know, the contrast between the devotion that they felt for Mao and how he so easily trashed their lives. Right. But before we get to that, though, I think let's let's continue with this thread because one of the key quotes from that early segment that we have is that the things that were done to statues, to signs, to objects, very soon were done to people. Right. And this is, I think, why we're starting to see now people invoke the Cultural Revolution, because when we look at what has taken place in the last year, we've seen in America, in Western countries, mass protests. We've seen tearing down signs, renaming right. streets, all right. with a particular ideology right. that is driving it, and with a concept of our culture that says that what we name things, statues that we keep space for in our communities, mean something 
to the extent that we have to tear them down and replace right. them in right. alignment with this ideology. And right. so it's so important to understand how that precedes doing it to people. And that's what we're going to start to see now. Right. So let's, let's take a look. Zhou and Lai's implicit distinction between smashing bourgeois ideas and smashing bourgeois individuals is quickly forgotten. Over the next few weeks, tens of thousands of people in Beijing are harangued and severely beaten. Many hundreds die. What 当时这个盛行的一句毛主席语录就是革命不是请客吃饭不是会花西花不能那样雅致那样温良共建商革命是暴动是一个集体推翻一个集体的暴烈行动这句话非常popular was the spirit that was encouraged the first year of the Cultural Revolution the army was told hands off the police were told hands off and Mao said, let the young champions make their own mistakes, learn from their own mistakes, and correct themselves. We can't stand behind them and point and criticize. So it was a great free-for-all. Yeah. <clears throat> what you saw in those images where there was just a huge mass of people surrounding people who had been called out for being impure ideologically, for right. trying to be capitalist or came from a family that had a degree of wealth in the past or, you know, were a landlord in the past. Even if you were a peasant and you worked hard and saved up and had a little bit more because of your extra effort, you were considered a wealthy peasant who right. was an aspiring capitalist. And so you were called out and demonized. And it's not just that you were criticized, it's that you were publicly shamed and denounced. And if you held to the ideology of Mao Zedong thought, you kind of felt that you perhaps were a bad person. And if you're in this society culture, you don't, you don't have any other ideas other than what is surrounding you and your entire community is condemning you as an, a bad element. And that it's something that's so bad that it's passed to your children, then you lose hope for life. And if right. they haven't beat you themselves to death, you may see that life is hopeless and rather than subject yourself to more torture, you may commit suicide. And, and these stories of suicide, right. torture, murder in this social context are starting to just emerge all over the place, starting in Beijing right. around that area and then pervading throughout the, the yeah, nation. Exactly. And actually, you, at that time, uh, that's how uh, what I call the theory of democracy is because... People decide, the majority decide what to do with certain people. Me, mm -hmm. yeah. So they always have, they call the, it's a mass court, kind of like, and, and so people there basically saying, they will say, okay, what are we going to do with this guy? And then people say, okay, let's kill him. It's mob justice. Right. All that's required is an accusation. And then everybody is shouting. It becomes a performance where everybody is competing to be more revolutionary than the person before them, and that drives you to more and more extremes of action. This person says, well, I'm going to pull his hair and shave half of his head, and the other says, well, I'm going to do something even worse, and it just right. escalates and escalates until they end up killing. And, and we just see story after story of this from my audience we start to hear people talk about struggle sessions and this gets invoked in the modern day term of cancel culture mm -hmm. and people who live through the cultural revolution are saying wait a second there's something about these public denunciations but on an ideological lines that serve to shame people that then lead to mass people on twitter 
piling on and saying, well, let's find out where they work and then let's tell their employer that they are such and such. Right, they're right. bad. They're evil. They're racist. They're bigots. Let's try to get him fired. Mm -hmm. You know, and those the psychological feeling of that the entire world or the entire community, if you you know, if you're canceled and your inboxes and your private messages are filled with hundreds of people who are denouncing you, saying that you're a bad person, that you were, you know, not worthy of love or goodness, then it, it bears a psychological toll. And we have stories even today of people who have been canceled and subject to that psychological bombardment from right. their community, right. the worldwide community who go on to commit suicide. And, and that's not, you know, there are even instances where people lose their employment because right. of these um, activities. Yeah. yeah. So you have every, everything from minor actions to very, very major actions. That yeah. And also the thing is uh, that this thing can get out of control. And at the first people think, okay, it, 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 it won't affect me, right? I'm not that rich. Yeah. I'm not that. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, they will get you. I mean, unless you prove that you are more radical than they are. So that became, you know, the whole thing becomes crazy. And the game becomes then you've got to accuse someone before you get accused. Right. And then not only that, but if you accuse someone now, you may still be subject to accusations later. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, it, and, and if you could see, just take, take this set of circumstances and imagine how it projects onto a, a broad society and realize that it creates a society where nobody can trust anyone else. Right. Everybody is suspicious and paranoid. No one wants to actually share their real thoughts no. and opinions. Nobody can share any diversity of opinion or thought no. because they leave themselves vulnerable to accusations, particularly when there's this strong ideology that cuts through the society and culture that shuts down any other perspective. Right. That's exactly what's going on there. Now, there's something very, as we talked about, very religious about Mao and the institutions and the culture that's set up as the communists take power, as the cultural revolution starts to then clear away any of the old traditions. And in addition to street signs, shop signs, and people, another aspect of the cultural revolution was taking the thousands of years old traditions, religions, and mm -hmm. older cultures of China that would compete with Maoism and destroying them and blanking them out of history. One of the things that George Orwell is so good at articulating is the power of authoritarian states to try to blank out history and reduce history and to right. insert itself into anything that might hold any space of devotion in the minds of the po people other than the state, the government, right. the, the authority and control. And so one of the things that happened is that there were still temples and religious orders that existed at the time of the Cultural Revolution. A lot of them had been minimized and, and done away with as the communists took power, but there were still pockets of Christians and pockets of people who were Buddhist and okay. um, followers of Confucius. And the Red Guards, these fanatic, idealistic youth who saw the world in very black or white terms, who were very naive and were being used by Mao, who understood the power he held over their right. minds, were then sent out to do away with the four olds, you know, old cultures, old traditions, old customs, old habits, old ideas. Right. And that included all of these traditions. Now, traditions, whether they're religious or philosophical, that that evolve and last through centuries and are part of communities, the very fact that they have survived that long tells you that they have an element of cohesion and replicability. They keep societies and communities together. They, they don't form the type of dis complete dissolution and, right. and devolvement that happened in the Cultural Revolution. So we see that happening where they've demonized these religions, saying that they're against, you know, our great future in Mao Zedong right, thought. Right. And let's see uh, some examples of that. One of the quotations from Mao that was most popular on the part of the rebels was that without destruction, there's no construction. First destroy. And on the basis of the destruction will arise something new. So it was destroy and then see. And then it, 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 it has to become a better world. And of course it didn't. It became a much worse world.
The physical destruction wrought by the Red Guards was unparalleled even in China's long history. Monasteries all over the country, as far away as distant Tibet, were ransacked and razed to the ground. The most important sites, like the Forbidden City, were protected on the orders of Zhou Enlai. But elsewhere, Mao's stormtroops had free reign. Thousands of rare books, some of them unique editions, were consigned to the flames. However radical they may be, all revolutions build in the image of what they destroy. As the old Confucian orthodoxy was damned, new Maoist rituals took its place. Telephone operators in the Cultural Revolution, instead of saying hello, greeted callers with the words, long live Chairman Mao. And in the countryside, pigs had the character Loyal branded on their flanks to show that even brute beasts appreciated the chairman's genius. All ideas contrary to Mao's thinking and the objects that represent them have to be destroyed. Not just Confucianism and Buddhism, but even more so foreign faiths like Christianity. Throughout the country, churches are closed, clergy unfrocked, religious symbols smashed. The statue of the Virgin Mary is replaced by a portrait of Mao. One form of worship succeeds another. This is not simply the cult of a leader, it's a full-blown religion. A religion in its most naive and primitive stage of development, complete with miracle plays and feudal superstitions. Each day, all Chinese, even the blind and deaf-mutes, must seek guidance from Mao's works. The ceremony is called seeking instruction in the morning and reporting in the evening. From the humblest railway employee to the highest in the land, every Chinese has to show at each moment that they're imbued with love for Mao. I love the point that they make there that these revolutions rebuild in the image of what they tear down. Right. You know, human societies and culture have a need for the things that, you know, religion has really fulfilled in them, whether it's a, a community, a purpose, a ritual. And if you look at the history of many of these religions early on, they become radicalized. They come, become what we describe as puritanical, where you know you have standards of what it is to be good and righteous, and they go in extremes and they start to purge things. And then I, I think you can look at the sort of the landscape of a lot of religions and they, they'd back away from that. You know, and there's this sense in Christian communities that there was this old notion that people, you know, you went down this puritanical line, but more commonly accepted notion now that Christ is the only one who's perfect, we are all imperfect, and it takes away the justification that you would have to go down that, that pathway that we see happening, that there's no breaks on it in the Cultural Revolution. You know, you can accuse someone of being imperfect, ideologically speaking, and that accusation stands on its own just simply right. because you've made it. There's no moderating influence ideologically other than whatever Mao says. He, he right. holds total control ideologically. Thank you.